All right, let's kick this off. Welcome everyone to the second session of this, tra this morning track. Um, uh, this one we have Russ talking to us about uh, writing things for the web using Inuit languages. No, languages that aren't JavaScript. Um, so, are we all? Yep, we're good. Uh, please welcome Russ. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so yes, as Richard said, my name is Russell Keith McGee. I come from Wajok Noongar country, uh, otherwise known as Perth, Western Australia. Uh, in my day job, I am a senior data engineer at Savata. Savata is a ma uh, market research company. We use Python and data science to help brands to understand their customers. Uh, they help me get to conferences like PyCon and many others for which I am extremely thankful. If you have heard my name before though, it's probably because I've been a member of the Django core team for a little over 12 years now. Now, when I started with the Django project, way back in 2006, the web was a very different beast to what we see today. Way back then, the web was a very server-oriented platform. You wrote code that was gonna run on your server, which would then serve HTML documents to browsers. If you wanted those HTML documents to be particularly fancy, you might bust out some JavaScript to make them dynamic HTML or DHTML. Um, the idea of using Ajax to make pages not just dynamic in the menu response to a mouse click sense, but in the content changes on the page over time sense, was really only just starting to begin on the scene. And in that world, Python was right at home. It didn't matter what libraries or runtimes the user had installed. All the code was running on the server in an environment that you, as the developer, controlled. Python was a language that let you develop your ideas quickly. It had a rich ecosystem of libraries for business and system logic. The end client never needed Python. They just needed the browser. But over the last 12 years, the web has changed quite a bit. What started as a little bit of JavaScript has now grown significantly. And we're now in a situation where by line of code count, the amount of code needed by your front end can quite often compete with the amount of code that is needed by your back end. But even though we're seeing, and because we're, even though we're seeing more logic on the front end, we still need logic on the back end. Consider something like form validation logic. If you want to make a user interface really responsive, you need to do that on the client. Now, nobody likes duplicating their logic, but if we're gonna avoid that duplication, we have a problem. The browser only supports one language, and that language is JavaScript. So what do we do? Well, one option is to abandon any language other than JavaScript and just use JavaScript everywhere. That line of thinking is basically what brought us Node.js, and plenty of people have written plenty of great applications in Node, but this approach deeply concerns me. Polylingualism, speaking many languages, be it human languages or computer languages, is a good thing. There are countless studies out there that re reinforce the benefits of learning a second spoken language. Improvements in memory, perception, decision making and problem solving. In my 30 odd years of programming, I have seen nothing to that leads me to believe that the same isn't true for programming languages. Learning a second or third or fourth programming language, especially when it uses a completely different programming paradigm, is a great way to encourage your brain to think about problems in different creative ways. Every programming language is very slightly different. They each approach problems in different ways, they have different assumptions, and the ecosystems around those languages are all different. The proposition that all programming should be done in JavaScript is, to my mind, the very definition of if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The idea that JavaScript should be the single language that everyone uses simply because it had the good fortune to be the only language that Netscape supported in a browser 25 years ago, that's absurd. Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of very talented people in the JavaScript world and very good resources in that community as well. This isn't a critique of the specific strengths and flaws of JavaScript as a language, and any grand vision of the future that is based around a language monoculture is, to my mind, a folly. At the core of all good engineering is picking the right tool for the job. A language monoculture is an artificial constraint on the tools that are at your disposal. Interestingly, it wasn't always this way. When Netscape introduced the browser, they introduced this entirely new language called JavaScript. But Netscape was just one player in this new web space and other players had other ideas. In the mid 90s, Microsoft was everything and Microsoft's scripting language of choice was Visual Basic. So in early versions of Internet Explorer, you could script your web pages with VBScript. Now I say early versions, this was still valid until quite recently. Microsoft didn't formally uh, uh, deprecate VBScript on web pages until the release of IE 11 in late 2013. 
Python also had a play in this space. Up until 1999, Gita van Rossum was working at CNRI on an academic project looking into electronic knowledge storage and retrieval. And part of that project was a custom web browser called Grail, a web browser written in Python. And you could embed Python code in your web pages using the applets feature that existed in HTML2 and was removed in HTML5. The life cycle of an applet is a little bit different to the life cycle of code and a script tag, which you might be familiar with, but an applet could interact with the document in which it was embedded, and thus you had Python in the browser. Or Python in a browser, because Grail was the only browser in which this ever worked. But these were basically experiments. They were short-lived experiments. By the time the browser wars came to a conclusion in the late 2000s, JavaScript was the only language that any browser actually supported. Google made an attempt to introduce Dart as a new web, web language, but it, despite even Google's influence on the web, that didn't really take off. There haven't really been any serious proposals to add, the, add to this list of supported languages in the browser that are both serious and successful. So if we want to use a different language in the browser, we have to get creative. Demonstrate. Let's try to do something practical. Let's validate some credit card numbers. All the code for these examples can be found at this web page, uh, which is a live demo of all the code that I'm going to run today. For those who don't know, credit card numbers are self-validating. Uh, they contain a checksum. The last digit of your credit card number uh, is computed from all the previous digits, following a method known as the Loon algorithm. By using the Loon algorithm, it's possible to perform a preliminary check of credit card validity. It won't tell you if the user has sufficient funds, it won't protect against every typo, but it will protect against most simple typo uh, typographic errors. And it's a great example of the sort of logic that you want to run in the browser, because you want to give the user immediate feedback if they're flubbed in typing in their credit card number into your payment form. If we were to write a native JavaScript implementation of the Loon algorithm and connect it up to a form, you'll end up with about 30 lines, 0.6 kilobyte of native JavaScript code. If you minify that, it'll shrink down to about 0.4 of a kilobyte. But we don't want to write in JavaScript, so what options do we have? First option, write JavaScript, but use different spelling uh, and compile to JavaScript as a pre-compilation step. CoffeeScript is the simplest example of this in practice. CoffeeScript is, at its core, JavaScript, but with different spelling. It's got a few nice pieces of syntactic sugar that map onto JavaScript concepts. Uh, and of course, it's got syntax-significant white space in, in place of all the parentheses. And if you, run, uh, you write your Loon algorithm in CoffeeScript, you then compile it to JavaScript, there is a little bit of an overhead. The, if you look here, like the for loop in this code, three lines from the bottom, it's a little bit odd. CoffeeScript syntax is more terse than JavaScript syntax, but in compilation, the output gets a little bit more verbose. The compiled CoffeeScript increases our payload for our, for our, uh, our running code by about 30% to about 0.8 kilobyte. But again, you minify, it's only about 10%, so about 550 bytes. OK, but that's CoffeeScript. Can we use this technique for other languages? Say, another language that has syntax-significant white space, like, I don't know, Python? Well, yeah, sure, you can. And there's a bunch of projects that try to do this. The best one I've found is one called Transcript. Uh, so we can write our Loon algorithm in Python. Because it's Python, we can use list comprehensions and enumerate and actual integer arithmetic. Um, we can compile our Python source file. And again, we get. JavaScript. Now, this is just a small segment of the code that is generated. And right away, you can see this is definitely not JavaScripted. You would write by hand. <laughs> Why is it weird? Well, some of it is because of language idiom. JavaScript uh, for loops are C style for loops. They have a start and an end and an increment. Python uses for item in iterable. But beyond that, it's because we don't just want a language that looks like Python. We want it to run like Python as well. And Python's scoping rules are very different to JavaScript's. If you want to preserve Python's semantics in JavaScript, you can't just do a naive syntax conversion like CoffeeScript does. That part is easy. Um, but JavaScript has the same scoping rules as CoffeeScript. Python doesn't. For Python, you actually have to parse the code and generate JavaScript that exposes the same lexical scoping that Python expects. You also have to account for language built-ins like enumerate and sum. Python has a lot of batteries included that JavaScript doesn't have, so you have to provide them. If you were really aggressive, you could probably shake the source tree that of, of what uh, transcript has produced and strip out the built-ins you're not using, but to the best of my knowledge, it's not something you can do with, uh, with, with transcript at the moment. 
And your final, as a result, your final transcript product is 74 kilobytes of code. It comes down to about 32 kilobytes when it's minified. Most of that extra weight is actually the fixed cost associated with providing the built-ins. The actual Python module is about one and a half kilobytes, so about double the size of the JavaScript. So yeah, that's a lot more code. But you are now running Python in the browser. You're not running all of Python, though. You get the language. You get the built-ins. You can even access the DOM. Window, document, other DOM objects are exposed as global symbols in your Python namespace, and you can manipulate your HTML page to your heart's content. Great. Transcript also produces source maps, so you can debug your running Python code in the JavaScript debugger of your browser. But you don't get a REPL, a read, eval, print loop, otherwise known as the Python prompt or at least not a Python one, because you're ultimately running JavaScript. You can drop to a prompt, sure, but it's the JavaScript console where you're running JavaScript, not Python. You also don't get the standard library. You can't pip install requests and start doing client-side web requests. Transcript does include some pieces and has partial support for NumPy, but that's a very specific inclusion of, NumPy, uh, of Transcript itself. That's where a project like Aroboros comes in. Aroboros is part of the Beware project. Uh, it's an attempt to build a standalone implementation of the Python standard library, written in Python to the extent possible, but with a clear interface to system libraries when a pure Python implementation isn't possible, like, for example, when you start talking to networking. Aroboros is very much a work in progress, but it's an important piece of the overall picture if we're planning on allowing Python to run everywhere. OK, so transpilation proves that it's possible to compile to JavaScript from a source language other than JavaScript. So let's think outside the box a little bit. A Python compiler is just code. So can we write a Python compiler in JavaScript? If we had that, then we could actually ship Python source code to the browser, much like VBScript used to, but without needing any formal support in our language for the browser, for our language in the browser. And so yes, you can do that. Python and Sculpt are both implementations of the Python compiler written in JavaScript. And if you have a browser-side compiler, that means you can ship Python source code to the client. So you include the code for the compiler as part of JavaScript source, and then you include your Python source code in a script tag of type text Python. That script tag can then import other code. Python's import statement will look for and download a Python file at the same URL that's as part of its import strategy. You can also reference the DOM. Uh, Brython does this with a module import rather than putting the symbols in the global namespace. When the page loads, the Brython source code looks for uh, the script tags of type text Python um, and then runs them. I'm showing the procedure here for Brython, um, it's, but it's very similar for Sculpt as well. OK, awesome. So we have Python running in the browser. What's the catch? Well, what's the code size like? The Python code? Half a kilobyte. It's smaller than the original JavaScript. Can't be minified, though, because it's Python, and you actually you have to preserve the white space. But you need a 646 kilobyte bootstrap. <laughs> and that bootstrap has to be fully downloaded, parsed, and executed before any of the Python source code on the page executes. And that's noticeable. I've got a 50 megabit NBN connection at home. If I visit the Brython web page, they've got an amazing clock demo on the front page written in Python. But that demo isn't visible at all for two to three seconds after the page has finished loading, because the demo code won't run until the bootstrap has finished loading, running, compiling, parsing the Python code. What else is missing? Well, again, you get all the DOM and the access to the Python built-ins. You also get some of the standard library, but it is missing parts as well for the same reasons that Transcript is. You don't get any debugging. Brython doesn't provide source maps, and it probably isn't even able to, because you're not mapping from one source file to a roughly equivalent source file. You're mapping from the internal operation of an interpreter to source code that's running in that interpreter. Brython does have a debugging mode, but it's not connected to the JavaScript debugger that you're familiar with. You do get a full REPL, though. You've got a full Python interpreter at your disposal. You can't just open up the JavaScript console and start typing, but you can, without too much effort, add a debugging console to your web page that accesses the running Brython interpreter, compile your code, run your code, get, the, get a REPL loop going. But after that, you've still got a 650 kilobyte bootstrap. How much of that can we strip away and still have a working interpreter? Well, it turns out quite a bit, because what you're shipping to the browser is a full Python implementation. What do I mean by that? Well, a full Python implementation consists of a parser, 
which takes human source code input and turns it into an in-memory representation of the code. You've got a compiler, which takes that in-memory representation and turns it into something that can be executed. In C Python, that's bytecode. You then have an eval loop, which can read and run the output of that compiler. This is what you experience as the Python executable. And then there's the standard library, which is used by the code that's running through your eval loop. The approach that's taken by Brython and Sculpt is to re-implement the entire stack, do the whole lot in JavaScript. But all we need to be able to do on the client is run the code. So if we can ship a runnable version of the code, we don't need to ship the parser and the compiler. And Python has a runnable representation of the code. It's called bytecode. That's what you find in your PYC files. Bytecode is a little bit like sort of a high-level assembly language. It's an encoded set of instructions for, stack for a stack-based virtual machine that has basic primitives like pushing and popping things onto a stack, setting attributes on an object, handling exceptions, things like that. Bytecode is a runtime format used by the CPython interpreter. It's not part of the Python standard, so to, uh, so to speak. But there is nothing to say you couldn't create an independent implementation of the CPython virtual machine capable of running CPython bytecode. And that's what Batavia does. Batavia is another Beware project. It's part of, it's an implementation of just the CPython virtual machine written in JavaScript. What does it look like as an end user? Well, instead of shipping source code, you ship the PYC file, Base64 encoded, so it can actually appear on a web page. How much code are we talking about? Well, the byte code of the Loon algorithm is about 1.2 kilobyte of base64. If you were able to send it binary, which you could do, uh, it would come down to about 800, uh, 800 bytes. It's also mildly obfuscated, which depending upon your perspective may or may not be a good thing. Like you can't tell from that 7GWNCJ9 what code is actually running there, so your secrets are protected. Um, but just as with Brython, there's a bootstrap. Now, unfortunately, the current state of Batavia doesn't look too good. Um, over time, a lot of pieces have been added to Batavia, uh, time zones, encoding tables, handling for arbitrary sized integers, uh, parts of the standard library have you know, just accumulated, and then Webpack got involved, which really didn't help. Um, so Batavia currently weighs in as a five megabyte bootstrap. <laughs> However, once upon a time, Batavia's bootstrap was as little as 10 kilobyte of minified JavaScript. If you don't believe that's possible, Ned Batchelder's Byte Run project is a full Python bytecode machine written in 1,600 lines of Python. Alison Kapter did an amazing write-up uh, of that code in a book called The Architecture of Open Source. Um, so by leaving behind the need to compile code, you can lose a lot of what makes Brython heavy, which is weight that Brython can't shed because client-side compilation is how it works. Now, okay, the current state of Batavia is not especially competitive, but I th the underlying idea, I think, is actually quite viable. The implementation just needs a little bit of work there. Assuming we could solve that size problem, what would we get? Well, you get the DOM, you get your built-ins, and as much of the standard library as you care to ship, but again, no REPL or no debugging. Essentially, it's the same story as Brython, but you don't have a REPL because you don't have access to a compiler, at least not without doing a server-side a server -side hit. But this is a line of thought that's worth exploring. What Batavia is doing is essentially shipping code targeting a runtime. Batavia then provides that runtime, reproducing CPython's runtime in JavaScript. But JavaScript is a runtime. Can we target that runtime directly? One of the interesting side effects of having multiple browser vendors competing with each other is that over the years, they have competed with each other aggressively to make the fastest JavaScript interpreter on the planet. Thousands of person hours have been put into making JavaScript run fast. And a lot of that effort was put into something called just-in-time compilation, or JITing. JITing is a compiler technique that identifies pieces of code that could potentially run fast and turn them directly into machine code at runtime. A few years back, a team at Mozilla looked at the JavaScript language as a whole and worked out the subset of the language that jitted efficiently. In theory, if you only use that subset of JavaScript, your end code will run really fast. And they called this subset ASMJS. Why? Because it's effectively assembly level JavaScript. It's just a set of very low level primitives dealing with integer and floating point arithmetic, function definitions and function pointers. Here is some ASMJS code for adding two numbers. We define a JavaScript function, and the first thing we do is or the value of the first argument with zero. Logically, that means nothing. Any value ORed with zero is that value. But a compiler can then infer that the first argument must be an integer, because the result of a binary operation with an integer is an integer. 
And so any subsequent operation on that value must also be an integer operation. It doesn't need to actually do the operation. It can, just in time, decide that it doesn't need to be performed and only do the, the optimized calculation. There's a similar trick that operates with the unary plus operator and floating point operations. Now, nobody actually expects anyone to write manual JavaScript code like that. But rigorous mechanical application of rules and logic is something that compilers are really, really good at. And so people have built compilers to do it. Clang is usually thought of as a C compiler, but it's actually a toolkit for building compilers, parsing human readable source code, producing an intermediate representation that encompasses the underlying machine level instructions that need to be done, and then having backends to turn that output for specific CPU architectures. But ASMJS is also just a way to perform those machine level instructions generically. So you can write a compiler backend that outputs ASMJS directly. And Scripton is that backend. If you've got a language that Clang can compile, and there's a lot of them, it can output ASMJS output. And so we rewrite our credit card validation function in C, and we compile it within Scripton, we get something like this. A whole lot of completely alien, but 100% legal JavaScript code that will, at runtime, be very, very fast in a JavaScript virtual machine. Now, it is not just a magical fountain of speed. There is a price that is paid. ASMJS code runs fast, but you don't get a transparent bridge between JavaScript and your native code. Integers and floats can be passed back and forth really easily, but strings, you need to marshal them because ASMJS is assembler level code. You have to manage memory yourself as an array of integers. You have to allocate memory on a virtual memory heap and then point the ASMJS code at that virtual memory address when you pass around a string. And Scripton provides a bootstrap to help with this, but it's pretty low level. Uh, you can see here with a module.c call method, which is used to call a C function from your Inscripton module, you have to manually specify the types of all your arguments so the bootstrap can then allocate memory for the string argument when it's being invoked. You also don't get access to the DOM. Now, this is an area the, the, the language W3C Working Group is working on, so watch this space. You do, however, get access to raw Canvas and OpenGL 3G, uh, 3D graphics APIs. So there are some really cool 3D game and graphics processing demos running entirely in the browser. You can see them on the, the WebAssembly um, homepage. But if you want to manage some logic, and you're happy to write the DOM interactions yourself, you can get any code that Clang will compile and get it running in the browser. But even ASMJS can be improved upon. What is delivered by ASMJS is still JavaScript code. It needs to be transmitted in a text format as JavaScript source, and then parsed, interpreted, and jitted. Now, if we know ahead of time that our code will be compatible with this fast JavaScript subset, can we send it to the browser in a ready-to-use format? We can, and that's what WebAssembly is, or WASM. WebAssembly is a binary format, formalizing the ASM, ASMJS language subset in a format that can be delivered to the browser in a format that is basically packaged to say, I've already parsed and jitted this for you. This makes it smaller and faster than ASMJS, even though fundamentally it is the same code that's being executed. Now, there is a source code uh, format for WebAssembly called WAT, uh, WebAssembly text. Um, it is, <laughs> it's a sort of a hybrid between Lisp and assembly language. This is really just giving formal names to the binary operations that are inside, uh, that are, uh, that are inside ASMJS, rather than relying upon compiler tricks. The uh, WAT file can then be compiled to WASM, which is a pure binary format. This means it is plausible to write, handwrite WAT if you want to, and then compile it to WASM, but WAT is also supported by Inscripton, some other compilers, so you can take C code, run it through Inscripton with a different set of flags, you get WASM output. Output, that is, smaller, faster than the ASMJS equivalent. Just as with ASMJS, there's no DOM access, so you need to do that bridging yourself. This is not a theoretical future thing either. WASM is supported in all of the major browsers right now. If, you are, if, your, if your problem suits WASM's capabilities and you can set a minimum browser version that's about you know, 12 months old or thereabouts, you can use it right now. Okay, but we had to rewrite our Loon algorithm in C to use Inscripton, so that doesn't help us run Python, so why do we care? C Python's interpreter is written in C. Can we use Inscripton to compile C code? <laughs> can we compile C Python? Why, yes, of course we can. That's what PyIodide is. 
Now, the bridge between Python and JavaScript provided by PyIodide is a little bit odd. What you end up doing is running a script, passing in JavaScript arguments as strings to the script that's going to be called, and the last expression in the Python code is the return value of the PyIodide call. Now, this is at least partially because of the developer's primary use case for PyIodide is essentially to get sort of Jupyter-style notebooks running completely in the browser with no server-side support. In that context, what you want is large chunks of text provided by the user to execute. The interaction between Java and Python is fairly minimal. The downside, it's not small. At least at the moment, there's a lot of caveats. What you effectively get is embedded CPython in a browser. That is great for Python shell in the browser demos, Jupyter notebook sessions, even like 3D games. Um, there's no DOM, there's no browser debugging. And while you do get the parts of the standard library that are written in C, you don't get anything that depends on the interesting parts of the C standard library, so sockets are out, for example. And it is big. Uh, the WASM file for PyIodide is almost three megabytes plus 65K of minified bootstrapping, and that's before you've even given it the Python code to run. Two reasons it's large. The first is because just like Python, it's a Python runtime, not just a, bright, a bytecode interpreter. The second is that it includes, compiled in by default, a whole lot of extras, including lots of numerical processing tools. Again, that's fine for a computational notebook. You download the page once, wait a couple of seconds, keep the page open and keep running. But when you're having to deliver all that excess client to a web page that's doing credit card validation, that's overhead you don't really need. Good news is there's plenty of room to optimize there. CPython also isn't the only viable target. PyPy is written in C, the uh, jittered Python compiler. Because it's written in C, it can be compiled within Scripton as well. Ryan Kelly experimented this for a couple of years ago. He was even able to get the download down to a very svelte two megabyte. And because WASM, can turn out, uh, um, WASM could turn out to be the way to save Batavia's size problem, stripping back the C Python to just the runtime and getting that into WASM format may end up being the best way to get a small and fast Python in the browser. I have been focusing on Python, but none of those techniques are especially Python-specific. I like Python a lot, but I don't want Python to be a monoculture any more than I want JavaScript to be one. There are countless other languages that have analogs to the techniques that I've described here. There are countless language X to JavaScript transpilers. There are bytecode machines and their equivalents. And there are WASM targeting compilers. The Rust compiler, for example, now ships with the ability to compile directly to WebAssembly. And there are projects out there doing that for Python. Rust Python is an attempt to provide a, a Python interpreter in Rust. And another one, Python VM Rust, that implements a CPython virtual machine in Rust. If we can take that project's source code and Rust's ability to produce WebAssembly, profit? <laughs> so the future of a web with other options other than JavaScript is looking really promising. Where to from here? We're getting really close to breaking JavaScript's monopoly on web development uh, as being a web development language and making Python and other languages a viable option for web page development. There are some pieces missing. The, one, the big one that I've uh, mentioned is WASM support for the DOM. Without DOM access, the WASM approach really won't be useful unless the app is completely self-contained. And that works great for games, but if you want web browsers to remain as discoverable internet content, not just the second coming of Macromedia Flash, um, well, <laughs> we're gonna need DOM access. Um, tied in with that is WASM support for garbage collected memory models. Uh, WASM currently requires you to manually allocate and deallocate heap memory you're using, which again is fine if you're managing everything yourself inside a game window or something, um, but if you're interacting with the DOM and with JavaScript, potentially other modules written in other languages, we need to know what the garbage collection rules are for that memory when it gets, when it gets, uh, it gets dropped. Those two are needed for any language support. For Python specifically, we need a version of the Python standard library that isn't dependent on C, or at least one where the interface to C is very well documented. And we need better debugging integration. If we can't debug code where it's running, what's the point? But these are solvable problems. And in the case of the first two, the WASM working group is actually working on them. As for the other two, well, the last couple of years, the work I've been doing has been captured under the umbrella of the Beware project. Beware is my attempt to enable us to use Python anywhere you might put your business logic, or on your phone, your tablet, your set-top box, and yes, in the browser. Robros and, and Batavia are both parts of the Beware project. Another piece I didn't mention today is Toga. That's our cross-platform widget toolkit. Supports the browser as a deployment platform. Uh, Bugjar is another Beware project. That's a debugger that could potentially fill the gap for browser-side debugging. I will be here Monday and Tuesday sprinting on uh, both of these days um, and other, well, these on, and on these and other parts of Beware. Uh, I've got stickers if that's your thing. Or if you just want to chat about a future where we can write browser apps uh, in languages other than JavaScript, come say hi. I'll be out, the, uh, I'll be out and around uh, for the rest of the conference. So thank you very much.
bang on time. Thank you so much for asking.